a lot of heavy-duty words in Unit 17 vocabulary. The first of them is the verb hamartano. It gives you the principal parts of hamartano. Hamartesamai, hemarton, a second aorist. Notice, not one with an SA. Hemarteka, hemartemai, and hemartethein. Um, and it tells you that it means miss, like miss a target, um, and, and it governs in that case a genitive. Uh, so you can tell why. It's a genitive of separation. You're missing away from the target. Um, it also means without an object, make a mistake, goof up, okay? And in that connection, they give you the noun derived from hamartano, hamartia, uh, first declension abstract noun that means a mistake. Okay, um, this is the word that Aristotle used in his Poetics when he talked about uh, um, this, this, uh, what happens in a tragedy, um, and he, this is the word that got translated, I think, incorrectly, and so do a lot of other people now. Tragic flaw. It just means a mistake, a goof up. Okay, it's not something bad in Oedipus's character. That makes him uh, make a mistake, and he's he's a great man, and he does very intelligent things, and ends up do for all the good things that he's trying to do. Do it ends up in a disastrous situation. So it's not really a mistake. It's it's a uh, it, 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 a flaw in his character. It's just things didn't come out right. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the the problem of tragedy is people who are trying to do good things, and they end up producing horrible errors, right? right? That's tragic. Somebody bad who ends up doing badly is not tragic. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Anyhow, all right, well, let's get off the, the podium here and stop making speeches, all right? <laughs> the next word is barus, barrea, baru, a word, uh, uh, an adjective that's inflected like hedus. A little closer. Hedus, hedea, hedu, which means sweet, this means heavy. It also means deep. Um, and we get the verb dokeo. Dokeo, those principal parts are doxo, edoxa, okay, not dokeso. Notice it's not, principal parts are not like an epsilon contract verb. So something else is going on. Doxo, edoxa, and dedogma, and edoctane. There's no perfect active of this verb. And it means two things seem and think. Okay, and most often this verb is impersonal, but it can also be used personally. And the book gives you a, an example of this verb in the sentence uh, where you can see that these two meanings, seem it's, it, it, and think, are possible. Um, and you have to distinguish in any given context which it is. I think more often than not, it means seem. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, but uh, uh, you have to try them out and see what works. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, Greek likes to say, it seems good to do this. Okay, that's the way, for example, to crease the Athenian democracy began. Edoxe, todemo, it seemed best to the democracy, to the people, rather, to do this, that, and the other thing. Okay, a kind of modest way of, of decide, making, of reporting a decision. Okay, um, but, uh, so this is a very common word in Greek, and, uh, and you have to get the hang of these two meanings that it has. Um, the next word is dunamai, um, which is a, an athematic verb that exists only in the middle. Its inflections, it, we, we have had words that are like this, I think. Yes, uh, epistamai is another one we're going to learn, and dunamai. And these are athematic verbs, but they don't have the vowel alternation that the other ones have that you see in uh, feme most recently, and amit to go. Um, or in didome, uh, and histeme either, and there, there isn't reduplication going on there. So they're relatively easy to inflect because you may remember that the middle endings of the athematic verbs are, are easier than the active and than regular verbs because there's no contraction. So it's dunamai, dunasai, dunatai, the root is duna. Okay, so you just add on the endings, dunas, adunamai, adunamain, and so forth. Then there are hurts of course. So this verb is a really useful one. It means to be able, and it governs an infinitive, just like to be able would in English. Mm -hmm. Okay, to be able to do something. The English word dynamite comes from it. Okay, because the root noun of dunamai is dunamis. Okay, which means power. Okay, think of it. Makes sense. So, Mr. Nobel used 
a word that means power for his explosive. All right, um, we, we talked about the word that, uh, for the number two, duo, cognate with two in English, okay? And the book also teaches you second, the ordinal number, deuteros, deutera, deuteron, means also favorable, okay? But anyhow, um, then there's the verb aime, to go, which gives you the present uh, form, and then every other principal part is a blank. And it's kind of even a little misleading. In other words, we only have attested for this verb present forms. Uh, in older Greek, it is a present. In classical Greek, most of the time, it's a future. Um, and we have the verb alauno, an important concept in, in, in Greek society, um, especially in the more archaic layers, because it means to move, make an animal move, okay? The regular object of verbs like alaunoi are um, people sometimes, but most of the time cattle or sheep or pigs, okay? So it's drive or march in the transitive sense of march, okay? Um, so that's the present of it. Look at the principal parts of it. It's a low, and it tells you in parentheses, a lao. In other words, it's an alpha contract future. Okay, remember in the standard notation of Greek dictionaries, if there's no, if you can, if you got a contract future and there's no explanation of the contracting vowel, it's an epsilon contract, like in Omeo we had in uh, unit 60. And here it tells you that it's a lao. And then a lasa, um, elelaka, elelamai, elatein. So um, this is a verb, a transitive verb to drive. Um, the next word is epistemai. We have epistemology from this root, and it means to know. Um, means to know becomes in the philosophical vocabulary uh, opposed to the verb dokeo, which means to think, that is to have an opinion. Okay, so there's doxa in Greek, which is the noun derived from dakeo, which is opinion, and episteme, which is knowledge. Anyhow, epistemai is ultimately derived from histeme, but no longer apparently so to Greeks. Um, and so it means no, and, and the principal parts are epistesomai, that's rare, and epistethane, I don't think I've ever seen it. <laughs> but that, that that's a aorist passive construction, but there's no aorist active of this verb but uh, you do see it in the present of the imperfect more than anything. And then they give you the noun episteme, the word for knowledge. Um, next is one of the most common verbs in Greek, echo, the verb to have or to hold. Those are two distinct meanings in, um, in English. And actually, Greek has some kind of split in some of the forms. So there are two futures of echo, hexo, notice there's an H there, we can talk about that in a minute, or skeso, and hexo means I will have, and skeso means I will hold, okay? Mm -hmm. This means grasp something, okay? So when you do have the the, this, the ability to have two forms, Greeks are, are it's conscious of the this diathesis, this split in the meaning of this word. It's got a second aorist, eschon, and then a perfect escheka, and eschema is the perfect middle. No, no air is passive given here. So um, it means have or hold. With an infinitive, when it's followed by an infinitive, echo plus infinitive, it competes with nunamai. In other words, it means to be able. When you use it with an adverb, okay, so you can say kados echo, okay, um, it means to be, okay. So plus an infinitive to be able, plus an adverb just to be, okay. Um, interesting idioms associated with this verb. And also the book tells you, and nicely so, that in the middle it means to cling on to something, to hold on to something, in other words, or to be next to something um, with a genitive object. Okay? Um, okay. Next word is hedus hedea hedu, the word for pleasant or glad or sweet, okay? Cognate with English sweet. There's malasta, which means most. It goes with malon, the word that means more. We talked about this in connection with comparatives. There's medes, which goes with udes. Medes, medemia, meden. Udes, udemia, uden. Um, both mean the same thing, just 
some places syntactical rules and recall from may and others ooh right the general rule is ooh negates facts may negates hypotheses okay but there are other things that it, that are, are the this contrast is vehicle for different semantic splits as well then we get a a, a bunch of of uh, interrogative words and some new demonstrative and relatives with them. We get the interrogative possos, posse, posson, which means how much, how much, how many, how large. Um, when it's plural, obviously it means many, and how much is going to be singular, and how big or large. And then uh, related to this, they teach you tasutos, tasaute, tasuta which is a form of who toss, how te, who ta, with a particle ta, and toss rather in front of it. So that means so much, so many, so large. Okay, And then the relative in this family, hasos, hase, hason. So if you, you kind of present it in a funny order, hasos is the kernel, the relative, which is as many as, or how, how much, how many, how large in a relative way. Then Tos, pasos, posse, pasan, how many, how, how much, how, how large, and then tosu, tos, tosaute, tosu, to. Um, there's a little chart on um, page 505 that lays out a couple of these words um, along with one that you've already had, hoya. So we've had poyas, poya, poyon, and we're now having pasos, pase, pasan. Poya is about quality, pasos is about quantity. In fact, the word for quality in, in Greek is poyates, and the word for quantity is posates, okay? Um, and so you get the demonstrative that goes with it, toyutos, with poyos, and the relative hoyos, and then poya, posos, we get tosutos, the demonstrative, and hosos, the relative. All right, so that's a nice little chart. Next word is another one of these interrogatives. This is pateros, with the teros suffix, okay? And it says, it defines it as meaning which of two. So it, it's it's which of two as an interrogative. And um, again, the teros suffix it invokes two things next to one another, okay? And the pa is the interrogative part. It, it also tells you about the adverb pateron, which is often used with the with the word e, the word that we've learned means than, to introduce alternative questions. In that meaning, okay, the book says introduces alternative question in italics because there is no word that this word answers to in English. We don't have a word that does what pateros, pateron does, rather the neuter form, the adverbial form of pateros. It introduces an alternative question that tells you that there's one coming, but as you can see from the book's example, okay, um, I think they have one, yeah. Pateron ton Socrate timas e u. This is on page 505. Are you honoring Socrates or not? And that sentence begins with pateron, so you, you, there's no word in English, an English sentence that translates it, okay? but it tells you that there's an alternative, which is introduced by A. So the, 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 the conjunction A means than with mm -hmm. comparative, but it also means or. And you can have A, A, either or. Should have said that. I don't know why we didn't get to that somewhere else. All right. Um, last few words are the numbers, teteres and tres, which we've already talked about. And another eustem adjective like barus and hedus, that's tachus, the word for fast. It ultimately gives us the English word taxi, comes from this. <laughs> tachus, tache, tachu. And then lastly, they introduce the preverb, huper. Now, you remember this, you may remember this as a, um, as a, um, uh, pre, as a preposition, meaning beyond, or hyper, our English word hyper comes from this. And when you use it with verbs, it means greatly or um, on behalf of. So hyper hypertrophy and all those kinds of words mm -hmm. uh, in English uh, uh, exhibit the meaning of hyper as a preverb, but they haven't taught you any preverbs. So that's it.